on the cross. Open arms of love, nailed there for us. God's love never fails. He is faithful through the by my side God's love never fails God's love is enough through any change when all faith away His love remains God's love never fails He is faithful through the storm Though the waves are high He is by my side God's love never fails. God's love will prevail, though sin seems strong. Since chains are gone, God's love never fails. He is faithful through the storm. Though the waves are high, He is by my side. God's love never fails. He is by my side. God's love never Luke 11, please. Let's turn to Luke 11 and let's stand together out of respect for God's Word. Thank you for that song. Did that minister to anybody's heart? Amen. The good thing about technology today is you can hear it again. So get online and hear it again, and then hear it again. Then when you get down, hear it again, and play it again. And maybe it'll go viral. Amen. Let's look at Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. Luke 11 and verse 1. And it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased... One of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask for your blessing and guidance. And Lord, we know that your desire is that our relationship with you would get fixed. And we pray for you to help us in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. And you can be seated.
at a college uh, that was training young people to be preachers, the professor gave a question on a quiz. This is true. It happened a few years ago. The question was on that quiz, does prayer change things? And of course, every Bible college student studying for the ministry just wrote, well, that's an easy, yes. And then they wrote rest, yes on there. And then when they got their paper back after being graded, it was marked wrong on each of their papers. So they all felt like maybe there was a mistake. Maybe the professor had for some reason messed up his key that has all the answers. So they went up to a few of them and after kind of talking to each other, what, what, what? And then they went up and talked to him and he said, uh, they said, why did you check this wrong? I think there's a mistake on your grading key. And they said, I checked it wrong because it's wrong. And so then they said, what do you mean prayer doesn't change things? And then his response was, well, God had already determined before the earth was ever formed the things that he would do in the affairs of man. And to say anything less than that would be to say that God is not in control and that God is not sovereign. Well, that may be some professor's theology, but that's not what the Bible says. Prayer does change things. And he says, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And that's in verse 9 and 8. And that is implying if we don't ask, then we won't receive. If we don't knock, then we won't have the door open. And if we don't seek, we won't find. And there are many other verses that say that prayer changes things. Ye have not because ye what? Ask not. And so that might be somebody's theology, but that doesn't line up with the Bible. Now we do know that God is sovereign, which means he's in charge. And he'll do whatever he wants to whenever he wants. And there's nothing that he wants that's not good and holy. But that does not mean that God doesn't answer prayer. And he wants, in his sovereignty, to answer prayer. It says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And in his sovereignty, he decrees, Ask, and it shall be given you. Now, the disciples in this verse said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, I want you to notice they never said, Lord, teach us to preach. And I'm a preacher. They never said, Lord, not one time, Lord, teach us how to preach. They never one time said, Lord, teach us to do miracles. Now, don't look at this as something insignificant. They never asked, Lord, teach us to do miracles. But they did say, Lord, teach us to pray. And not one time did they say, Lord, teach us how to walk on water. Now, Peter did say one time, can I walk on water? Didn't say, teach me how, or teach me to do this regularly. He just asked that one time, but that wasn't what the request was. Lord, teach us to pray was the request. Never even, though I'm all concerned about this, teach us to be holy. Never it said, teach us to calm a storm. It was, Lord, teach us to pray. And it is significant that God said, Lord, teach us. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, as we began the revival meeting a while back, I remember uh, we were led to look at um, the purpose of a revival or what we're, we're, we are going at in a revival is we're not going after seeing how many people get saved, though we do want to see people get saved. We're not going after people living a better life, but we do want people to live a better life. We're not going after people becoming soul winners, though if people have revival, they will become better soul winners. But what we are going after as we began the week is that our relationship with God would get fixed. The most important command is that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. Our relationship with God getting fixed. Even that verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, 
If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek me, then will I hear and will return to them. Man turning to God and God turning to man. And the revival is when our relationship with God gets fixed. And what we're looking at today, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Why? I'm going to tell us that at the end of the message. But I will preface it by just saying this. There's no way we're going to ever have a relationship with God without this. We can go soul winning, but without this, we're not connected to God. We can change our ways, but there are unsaved people that have holy lives and live better lives than some Christians. Have you ever seen somebody that's not even a Christian and they have a good life? I remember seeing one guy like that, and I said to the preacher, I said, is that guy one of your members of your church? He said, no, I don't even know if that guy's a Christian, come to think of it. And I said, man, he lives such a nice, uh, has such a nice personality and such a nice person. I su suspected he was one of your deacons. And that preacher said to me, Mike, you know what I found out? There are just a lot of nice people in this world, but they're not saved necessarily. So being somebody who lives a holy life in itself is good, but if we don't do this, we can live holy lives, but we still won't have our relationship with God. And what I'm saying is this is the essence, this is the fiber of a relationship with God. Now, we can try to pray, but not be holy, then we won't be connected with God. We can try to be connected to God by reading our Bibles, but without prayer, we are not going to be connected to God. And what I'm saying is our relationship with God coming to life will only come to life through this. We have to pray. Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. Humble yourself and pray, then will I hear from heaven, forgive and heal their land. And no person can ever rise above the level of his or her prayer life. Now, what I want to preach on this morning, and uh, I, I want to preach on this, and it is prayers that changed the world. Now, I've got about eight or nine different prayers here, but that doesn't mean we're going to look at each of them. We'll just see where the Lord leads us and get out in good time because me saying every little word isn't important that's on my cranium. But what is important is that we get connected to God again by prayer. So we're going to just start working through these and we'll quit when we need to quit and we'll listen to the Lord and learn what the disciples were talking about. Lord, teach us to pray and we're going to ask why did they ask for him to teach him to pray? Not to do miracles, not to preach, not to walk on water, not to be holy, not to calm a storm. Why? This question. And we're going to look at that at the very end and we'll, we'll I think, grow closer to God if we hang on to this truth. All right, now the first thing that I want to look at is the prayer of Nehemiah. Now this is a prayer that changed the country. So we're not going to get heavy on each one. We're just going to look at examples of prayer. So turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. And we're going to see a prayer that changed the country. Now, Nehemiah chapter 1. Um, Nehemiah is looking at the country. And he hears that Jerusalem is destroyed. And that the gates are destroyed. And it's a very impossible situation. He begins to fast and to pray for certain days. And others fast and pray as well. And the nation is rebuilt again. Now notice Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1 through 3. You've got all the bad news. And then notice verse 4. It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept. And I mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now, it's interesting that he says, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and began to pray. 
And what I get out of this is a spontaneous reaction, an immediate reaction. He saw the need, and immediately he was so overwhelmed that he immediately began to weep and to pray. Now, just a little note. We have one week until Election Day, and if we would understand the condition that we are in, that we are on the brink of a major change in this country, then we should be moved to immediately weep and to pray. Now notice that he was moved and there was a spontaneous response, go to God, because God is the only one who could do this. So he said, I went and mourn certain days. Now, how long did he pray for his country that it had resulted in changing? Basically, all we know is that it was days. Now, folks, we've got days before the election. We've got seven of them at least. But listen, it doesn't say that he sat down and said, Dear Lord, thank you for the food. And by the way, if you would, rebuild our nation. He is mourning and he's fasting and he's getting at it. And because he understands that God can do something about it. So he prayed. Now notice as we continue in verse 5, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments, And what is he praying? He's praying the promises that God gave. You know what I think he's probably lifting up before God? The promises that were written in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and 7. We hear this verse that says, If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, but get it. Nehemiah heard those verses too. And we hear in Nehemiah chapters, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, That if the people be worse before the enemy because they have sinned, if they return, that God will hear and will heal their land. And guess what? Nehemiah heard that prayer too, is what I'm saying. And so he prayed based on the promises of God. And we can pray for our country based on the promises of God and apply them to us too. Now keep reading in verse 6. Let thine ear be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee day and night. Now day and night could mean a couple of things. It could mean that he prayed for the country in the morning. His relationship with God was there every morning. It could mean he prayed also at night. His relationship with God was there at night and he looked to God. And he was going to God for this thing. But you know what? It could also mean day and night, all day long. Now, I don't think that Nehemiah stopped everything he was doing. I think he still had to be the cupbearer. I think he still needed to test the food because the king still wanted to eat that day. I may, may think that he needed to go ahead and take a sip, but he fasted, so he wasn't really eating a lot, but God still called it a fast. But he did this thing day and night, could mean twice a day, or it could mean throughout the entire day. And this thing was an important thing to him. And he prayed, and it changed the nation. Now, if you take a look at verse 11, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants. Now, what this means is that Nehemiah acknowledged, God, I'm not the only one praying. There are others who are praying too. And was it important that others were praying? Yes. Now, it was important and it was powerful and it was helpful that Nehemiah prayed, but it was also important and he acknowledged it because evidently it was important that others were praying to God. And that prayer by Nehemiah and those others resulted in the country being saved and changed. Now, we've got to be people that pray for our country. And frankly, that is how our country was founded, people praying. 
When the first Congress of the United States met together on September 7th, one of the first, 1774. The first was September 5th. The second, if I'm right, was September 7th. There was a rector named Duche of Christ Church of Philadelphia. He read Psalms 35 and then he prayed this prayer. They had just been attacked at Boston. Have you ever heard of the Boston Tea Party? Now listen, this is reality. This is history. This is what changed the country, this country. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty King of kings, look down in mercy we beseech thee on these, our American states, get this, who have fled to thee from the rod of the oppressor and thrown themselves on the gracious, on thy gracious protection. Defeat the malicious designs of our cruel adversary. Constrain them to drop the weapons of war from their unnerved hands in the day of battle. Be thou present, O God of wisdom, and direct the counsel of this honorable assembly. Enable them to settle things on the best and surest foundation that the scene of blood may speedily be closed, that get it, order, harmony, peace may be effectually restored. Truth, justice, religion, piety prevail. All this we ask in the name and through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy Son and our Savior. Amen. What an amazing prayer to start Congress in 1774. Now, I find it quite interesting. Pray for order. Has there ever been a time when things are not following order? Every man is doing that which is right in their own eyes. Pray for peace. Has there ever been a time when there's been more destruction, more division in our country? Listen, young people, wake up. You are in danger. If we do not see revival, we will not see our survival, and that is truth. We have got to have God's divine intervention in this country because we are so divided. And people are dividing over others who are not really dividing. They're just even adding division wherever they can. They're saying, this is divisive, this is racist, when it's not. This is hateful when it's not. And there are people that are bent on dividing, and we don't necessarily have to blame anybody. But I'm telling you, we need to pray for peace. And we need, as people of God, to believe that God can bring it. We need to believe that God can bring it. And we need to be fixing our relationship and our reliance on God to bring peace. And we need to be fixing this relationship with God to say that truth can prevail, to pray that justice will prevail, and to pray that um, religion, in the right sense, this is the sense of following Christianity, will rise again. And so, what was it that changed Nehemiah's country, prayer, Honestly, what needs to be done to change this country, this election, this peace, this rioting, this disorder, this destruction of, of, right, of justice falling in the streets? What is it? God. Either we believe that or we are just saying empty words And we can tell by how much we pray, by how much we believe. And so we have to have people pray if you believe that prayer changes things. All right, now, prayer changed the country. Now, the second one I want to look at is prayer changing the church. All right, take your Bibles and turn, please, to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Prayers that change the church. Now, in the church situation, they were all afraid, and they were afraid because they had just been threatened that if you keep talking in the name of Jesus, we will arrest you. 
we will beat you. And they were forbidden to speak in the name of Christ, and they were afraid. Now notice verse 23 of Acts 4, and being let go, they, the disciples who were threatened and beaten and arrested, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And what did they pray? Notice verse 29. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Notice verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were all assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they did what? They spake the word of God with boldness. Now, folks, please, let's not look at this as just a sermon on prayer. Revival is when our relationship with God gets real. And our relationship with God is not real just because we change our behaviors. Just because we start doing things that the Bible says we should be doing. Going soul winning as well. That alone does not fix our relationship with God. The only thing that connects us to God is prayer. The prayer of faith. Prayer in faith. Bible reading is learning about God. It is letting God speak to us, convict us, and we have to read our Bibles to be healthy, but we have to pray to be in fellowship with God. And when we look at the church, the church was afraid, and the church was withdrawn, and the church was was in retreat. They were afraid, and when they prayed, they were emboldened. Now, this is what we need to do to change our church. And to change the church across the United States of America, we need to pray. Now, as we look at this, if you want to see the church changed, pray. And not that the church is bad, but pray so the church can be powerful again. So we need the church to be powerful again. How many feel like the church's influence on the country is kind of less than it was 100 years ago? Even less than it was in the 70s. And so we've got to have life. And it's the oxygen, it's the blood, uh, maybe it's just the heartbeat. I don't know what the word is or the analogy is, but there's no life without the Spirit of God. And so we've got to be praying again. All right, number three, prayers that change the world. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Not walk on water, not preach, not be holy. Lord, teach us to pray. Why? Because prayers change the world. All right, prayer changed the nation, prayer changed the church, and they preached the word with boldness. I know Another area where prayer changed the world, changed the world for Job, and pray, prayer changed the world, at least Hannah's world, and the application of this is very applicable to many of us. There was a day when children would go wayward and mothers would pray instead of just fall into despair and just into discouragement, mothers would pray. And how many stories have we ever heard about people a hundred years ago praying for their children and God just divinely, supernaturally smacked them upside the head and said, straighten up, punk. And they did. And it was God's hand. Now let's turn in our Bible to Job. And in the book of Job, believe it. Prayer changes the country. Prayers change the church. But prayers also change Children. All right, now, in Job chapter 1 and verse 5, you see that Job prayed for his children. And you'll see it made a difference. Notice verse 5. And it was so when the days of their feasting was gone about, the children were all together feasting together, having a little get-together, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up, get it, early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all individually. 
How many kids did he have? I think it was 10. And he gave an offering for each of them individually by name. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job get it continually. Now, a couple of thoughts here is that Job prayed for his children and each one of them by name. And here's an illustration of prayers that change the children. Now, somebody says this. If you look at it, at the surface, let's be honest, shortly after this, all, five, all of his children were killed. Now, if you look at this, what good did that do? They all died. Ha! <laughs> Wasted time. Just proof that prayer doesn't make a difference. All right, listen, folks. We can't understand why God does everything He does. But what we do want to do is not look at the things that we can't understand. We've got to look at the things that we know. We know that God is totally incapable of sinning. My brother died five years ago, and I prayed like I never prayed, Lord, don't let him die. You're capable of healing him. And I prayed like I never prayed, Lord, don't let him die. I fasted like I never fasted. I'm not bragging. I know people that have fasted 40 days. I fasted seven. Now, for me, that was a pretty big deal. And just after fasting for seven days, my brother died. I thought, what a joke. Fasting making a difference. What a joke. That's a sick joke. How in the world could this work together for good? But I've looked at Romans chapter 8, and I'm totally convinced that my brother's dying. God's worked it out for good. And you have maybe had something bad happen in your life that you can't understand. You know what you could do? You could look at what you don't understand and doubt God, or you could look at what you know about God and stay with God. I know that God cannot sin, and so I'm just going to look at God with that. But in this, we may not understand why Job's children died, but we do know that God worked it out for good. We've all got a story that we have all been strengthened by. But that's not my point of this message. This message point is prayers that changed the children. Now, where do I get that this changed the children? All right, please look at verse 5 again. And it was so in the days to fasting were gone about that Job sat and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings. And here's what Job said. Get it. It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their what? Hearts. I now notice these words. It may be that my kids have sinned. It might be that they've sinned. And you know what I get from that? It wasn't obvious that they were sinning. And then what I get from that is in their heart, that means this is not an open rebellion. Nobody knows if they're sinning. It might be that maybe in their heart they've sinned against God and they quit trusting God. Or maybe in their heart they cursed God because they were mad at Him. But this is not an outward display of adultery, homosexuality, though God can change those things too. I am just saying this. I believe that Job's kids didn't have a life of sin. I believe that Job's kids weren't cursing God in their heart, or Job would have probably sensed that. You can tell when your kids' attitudes are off, but what I'm pointing out is why were they living for God? I think it's because Job was praying they would. And what I'm simply telling us, pray, pray. Now, who's going to do better at raising your kids and helping them to turn out for God or to get right with God? You and your mighty, 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 mighty depth of wisdom or God's divine supernatural intervention. So pray and believe that prayers change children. We've got story after story and experience after experience as observing the history of Christianity, even in modern Christianity, where prayers change children. All right, now we're talking about this. I don't want to be too heavy on this subject or too wordy because I don't want to make us go, oh man, just hurry up and quit. But I do want to say, we need to pray. Our lifeline can only be prayer. You guys who um, want to grow, pray. That's where we grow. All right, prayers change the world. Prayers change the country. Prayer changed the church. 
Prayer changed children. Hannah didn't have a child, as a matter of fact. Even having children, it changed the situation. She went in and she poured her soul out to God and she was weeping, Oh God, give me a child, give me a child. And she was so burdened that she would even have a child. You say, Oh, don't pray about that. Well, Hannah did. And she was praying, God, give me a child, God, give me a child, please, God. And she was so burdened, she didn't even move or say words. She just moved her mouth. And Eli looks at her and says, what is this wicked woman doing here? She's intoxicated. And he rebukes her for being intoxicated in the temple. And you know what? She said, I'm not intoxicated. I'm just burdened, Eli. And you know why Eli, the man of God, Accused her falsely because he never really prayed like that. He was super spiritual. He was one of these guys telling everybody what spirituality was. But he never prayed like that. But she did. And the point is, the real person that really changes things is not the guy like me standing up saying it's just right. The thing that really changes things is if this guy will get on his knees. And if that guy and that guy and that woman and that woman, our connection with God is revival, not a three-point outline. Now, prayers that change us, prayers that change our world, the country, the church, children. Let's turn in our Bibles over here to uh, Luke chapter 18. Prayers change the condition Prayers change the condition that we're in. Luke chapter 18. Now, in Luke 18, there was the blind man. And then he got his sight. His faith, not just his words, but his faith as he prayed the words. We can say words without faith, and that's not prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth which is in heaven as it is in heaven. Or it could be our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth in me as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That is so true. So be it. Amen. Now that can be words or that can be faith as we say the words. Words do not connect us to God. Faith, as we pray, connects us to God. And I've been guilty of words, but I've also experienced faith. Now as we look at Luke chapter 11... Uh, I'm sorry, not Luke 11, Luke chapter 18. I want to look at verse uh, 38. Luke chapter 18, verse 38. Here's somebody in a bad condition. Might as well back up a little bit. Verse 35, And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by, passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus! Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they went, which went before, rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. Just shh, shh, quiet. Stop it. And he cried so much more and more. He prayed so much more and more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood, commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. He prayed. And Jesus said to him, Receive thy thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. And he went from being a blind man to a seeing man. Prayer changed his world. His world was changed. Why? He prayed. You and I weren't that affected by it, but he was when he could see And then you have the leper that he prayed in Matthew chapter 8. And his faith, not his words, gave him healing. Now, the result, prayer changed the condition. 
All right, let's turn our Bibles over to Matthew chapter 14. Now, pray because prayer changes things. Professor's wrong. Prayers change things. I told my wife when I was with her the last time I was home, I, maybe a little bit before that, the second to last time, I said, Becky, I was just driving in the truck, and I just said, Becky, I want to be a good prayer. And she said, I said, more than I want to be a good preacher, I want to be a good prayer. And she said, well, Mike, being a good prayer isn't the words you say. I said, I know, you're right. But there does have to be quantity prayer if you're going to have a quality prayer. And I want to be a good prayer. You know what I would rather be? I would rather be a George Mueller than a Billy, I'm, I shouldn't say Billy Sunday. I, I'm glad to be a Billy Sunday. But I would rather be a Mueller who's got 50,000 dated definite answers to prayer than I would ever want to be somebody that is known as a preacher. I'd like to be known as a prayer. And it doesn't really matter what I like. But what I am saying is this. Prayer is where we really get connected to God. So look what happened. Even our capabilities can be changed. So prayers that change us, so pray. Prayer changed the country, so pray. Prayer changed the church, pray. Pray that this church would be alive, that the church would be powerful, that the church would make an impact, that the people would be bold. How many people in this room really do want to speak more than you've been speaking before the revival came? Just go ahead, let's just test this. Raise your hand if you really want to. And if you're not raising your hand, I know you want to anyway. But you have arthritis. But, but here we go. We all want to. But how many of you would say, I want to, but sometimes I get a little bit uncomfortable when I bring it up. So pray for boldness. It worked in the New Testament. It can work today. That's my point. Prayer changed children. If you don't have kids and you want them, pray. But accept God's will if he says no. If you have children that are not right with God, pray. Because Job did it and it worked. Now, ch prayers changed the condition. Pray. The blind saw. The leper was healed. The lame walked. Pray. The dead were raised. Pray. But prayer changed capabilities. Now, while we're turning, you're turning, if you haven't already found it, to Matthew 14. I want to tell you about Samson in Judges 16. We're not going to turn there. Samson was captured by the enemy, and he lost all of his strength. And as he lost all of his strength, he realized that he had been sent away from God, so God was chastening him. And so what did Samson do? He's brought out between the pillars, and he says, avenge me of mine eyes. He didn't have the strength. He didn't have the capabilities. But then God gave him the capability. And he defeated more in his death than he did in his life. His capabilities were changed. Now, if that doesn't excite you, fine. But I believe that capabilities can be changed. I've seen it. I've seen capabilities of this guy totally changed as I seek to minister for the Lord. Now, as we look at this in Matthew 14, I'm stalling because I'm trying to find it. But now I have found 23, 22, 19, 18, 16, 15, 13, and if I had found it sooner, we could have gone home two minutes earlier. But I do want to read this, Matthew 14, 27, all kidding aside. Um, let's go ahead and back up to verse 22. Straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him on the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into the mountain. And verse 24, uh, uh, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went up unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Get this, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Now, even in this passage, I don't want to miss this, we're going to see God... Increased capabilities, but don't forget this part. They were afraid, and Jesus simply said, be of good cheer. It's I. Be not afraid. And you know what we learned from that? Before God ever changed their capabilities or ever calmed their storm, he first calmed their heart. He said, don't be afraid. I'm here. It's me. 
And what I think is a good reminder to us, and part of our relationship with God, the blessing of it, is that as long as we know we have Him, we don't have to be afraid no matter what storm we're going through. That's true. So what storm are you going through? Be aware of His presence. Don't be afraid. But then, Peter answered him, said, Lord, if it be Thou, bid me come unto Thee on the water. Bid me come unto Thee on the water. And he said, come. So what did he do? He basically prayed. He says, let me walk on water. He said, bid me come to you on the water. And you know what? He said, okay. Now, here's a guy who up to this point had never walked on water. But God, as a result of his prayer, let him. And prayer changed capabilities. Now, as I mentioned, first time I went soul winning, you gave this testimony, that one week, one saved. Second week, three hours a day soul winning, nobody saved. Third week, nobody saved. Last week, 16 people saved. The only difference between the first, second, third week, and last week, I spent 30 minutes in prayer before I ever went soul winning, and it changed my capabilities. All right, now, prayers change the country, the church, our children, our condition, our capabilities, and there are many other things we could look at. James 4, 8, draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. Anybody feel distant from God at any time in your life? Prayers change that. Draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. Go out in the woods and pray. Communion. Prayer changes our communion with God. Not idol, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. It's you are hallowed. You are holy. You are who you are. And sometimes I'll even start, and as I'm beginning to pray, I still feel like I'm just saying words. Anybody else feel like that? But as you continue, you get into it, you really pray. And it changes your world. My world is so different when I'm in communion with God than when I'm not. So it changes our world, and we've all seen that who have prayed. So pray. Prayer changes our Christian life. Psalm 119, though not a Christian, in one sense a Christian in another, David prays in verse 33 through 40, change me, turn me, make me, show me. In Psalm 5110, create in me a clean heart, and prayer changes us as Christians. I want to look at this one, and we're about to wrap this up. This, and we'll go back to our text. Turn to Luke 23. Luke 23. The whole message, revival, never happens simply by changing our ways. Revival, real revival, doesn't happen in the church just because we get more motivated to win souls. And I am more motivated even after the week. Revival doesn't even change necessarily when we get rid of our bitterness. But it'll keep us from having a revival but genuine revival is when we really have a connection with God. That's revival. Our relationship with God comes to life, and it will never come to life without prayer. And I want to look at this one. Prayer changes this one, the condemned, the condemned. All right, Luke chapter 23. If you are here and, and, and uh, this fits you, you need to hear this one, Okay. All right, Luke 23, verse 39. And one of the malefactors were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condition, and we indeed justly? For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing, nothing amiss. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said unto him, 
Fairly I say unto thee, truly I say to you, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Two men hanging on the cross, one mocking Christ, both mocking Christ, as a matter of fact, when it began, but something happened as Christ observed, was there, and he was being observed by these two malefactors. And one of those thieves did one thing, prayed with heart and faith, and he looked at Jesus as he first rebuked the other. This man's done nothing. I know he's innocent, but we're guilty. And once you realize you're guilty and you're condemned, if you will pray, it will change the condemned. And it says, this man, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now here's what the Bible teaches. Prayer is the only thing that makes our relationship with God come to full life. Prayer is the only thing that actually makes it alive. And the, the country will not be changed by our reforming. The country will not be changed just by our getting a rally to get people to vote. We've got to pray. Because you can win an election and still have riots. You can win an election and still have violence, racism, division, no peace, abortion, homosexual growth, that thing continuing to grow. We can still have all these things, but... God can change it. The church can learn better techniques. The church can be more dedicated. The church can do all of these things. Get better organized. Actually have a little bit more fun. More people might come if we have a little bit more fun. Might increase in attendance, but that's not life. But it can have life if we pray. And all of these things are pointing toward the importance of life is only found in real prayer. And when it comes to the salvation of your soul, there's one thing keeping many people in this world from going to heaven. They just won't do it. And you know what will put you in hell? Your failure to pray. What do I mean? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And until you're willing and you, and you get to doing this, your relationship with God can never begin. It all starts with prayer. Now let's conclude by turning back to Luke chapter 11 and just uh, the importance of what we're talking about. And I think it'd be wonderful if we raised up uh, the awareness of the importance of prayer. The importance of this thing, the communion with God, and not idle words, vain repetitions, but real prayer. And real prayer is only there, real, when there's faith that he's hearing us behind those prayers. All right, so here we are in Luke chapter 11, and um, I want to look at where we started. It came to pass, that is, he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And I want you to notice again, they never ask, teach us to walk on water, teach us to be holy, teach us to calm a storm. They never ask, teach us to preach, do miracles, walk on water. What did they ask? Lord, teach us to pray. And here's what it is in a nutshell, because they're talking to Jesus, Lord, Usually I'll say, Dear Heavenly Father, they said, Lord, that was their prayer, and they prayed this, Lord, teach us to pray. So put it in what it was, it was basically this, Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll teach us to pray. We pray that you'll teach us to pray. Think of it. And we can do that. We can carve out time every day, 10 minutes. 15 minutes, we can pray throughout the day or teach us to pray day and night throughout the day while we do what we do. And then we can carve out times like 30 minutes to pray. We can carve out times just to go out in the woods and pray. Carving out time to pray because this reason. If they did pray, if they did learn to pray, 
they would see miracles when they needed to see them. If they did pray, they would be effective preaching. Why didn't they ever pray, Lord, teach us to walk on water? Because if they learned to pray, they could walk on water if they ever needed to. And so, why did they not say, Lord, teach us to be holy? Because if they learned to pray that God would help them and help them be holy, they would be holy if they learned to pray about that. And our children, they would be affected if we pray. They have a free will, but the best chance is we pray, and our country pray. And you will never get to heaven until you pray and call on the Lord for that. 51 minutes and 17 seconds, let's bow our heads. Now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Revival is when our relationship with God gets fixed. And I want to start with this idea of our salvation. If you don't know that you're on your way to heaven, you need to know. And the only way we can help you will be if you will let us. And I want to encourage you, if you do not know you're on your way to heaven, you come see us. See me. See pastor. Come see us.